Thanks again, everyone, for joining and welcome to today's program. I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, which is co-presented by our terrific partners at the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial Foundation. We're here to discuss My Name is Sarah, an award-winning film about Sarah Goralnik Shapiro and her harrowing journey through the Holocaust near the town of Koretz, Poland, which is now in Ukraine. The film, which was produced in association with the USC Shoah Foundation, was scheduled to be released in theaters last summer, but COVID caused a change of plan. So we now expect a theatrical release later this year. And we feel privileged to be able to brought it to our audience before its release. The film is important not just because it tells Sarah's powerful story, but also because it takes place in rural Eastern Europe and reveals a part of the Holocaust that's less familiar to many audiences. I hope everyone in attendance has viewed the film. If not, the private screening link that you received via email will still be active until midnight tonight. I'll put the link in the Zoom chat uh, for any of you who may have missed it and wanna watch the film this afternoon or this evening. Uh, before we kick off the discussion and introduce our distinguished panelists, we wanna play the trailer to the film just to set the stage for the discussion. So uh, let me pull that up. Israel, Adonai Elohino, Adonai Yehad. <laughs> I'm looking for work. Joe? No. Make the sign of the cross. This is our new girl. Forgive me, Jesus, for thy dear son. You wouldn't lie to me. Everyone lies. Lie to me and answer the throat. I am not a Jew. I swear. You can take the whole basket. You are not that important. Close, close, close here. Close. Mm. Have you killed Germans? It's not so easy to kill another human being. <laughs> what are you doing? Shut your mouth! I'm not talking about it. It's not safe. <laughs> I lied to the man who took me into his home. Is the truth? In confession, you must open your heart completely. My name is Sarah Guranli. Uh, it's a uh, beautiful and challenging story and it's told with real grace and sensitivity and amazing production value in the film. Um, and I know all of you who, who got a chance to watch it know that. Um, so today we are glad to dive into it a little bit more and explore the film with the team that made it happen. So our panel today includes Zuzana Surovi, who stars as Sarah Goralnik in the film, Stephen Orrit, who directed the film, Andy Entrotter, the co-executive producer, and Mickey Shapiro, who is also co-executive producer alongside Andy and is Sarah Goralnik Shapiro's son. Welcome Zuzana, Stephen, Andy, and Mickey to today's panel. So we'll chat for about 40 minutes uh, and then have time for audience Q&A and we'll try to weave audience questions in throughout. So please feel free to share them in the Zoom chat. And there is closed captioning available uh, for anyone who needs it. So we'll put instructions to that in the chat as well. All right, so to kick us off, Stephen, let's begin with you and with the setting of the film. The town of Koretz, where Sarah Goralnik Shapiro was from, and the surrounding countryside where much of the film takes place. Uh, I understand you traveled there when you were producing the film. Can you tell us what that was like? Sure. Um, thanks for having us here today. I'm really honored to be here with, uh, with everyone. Thank you for, for joining and tuning in. Um, before I ever took a trip over there, 
uh, the, 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 the two executive producers you mentioned who you see, uh, Andy and Trotter and Mickey Shapiro, took a trip there um, a few years before I ever did, about three or four years. Um, Andy helped Mickey kind of retrace his, uh, his mother's steps, the town that she was <clears throat> born in and raised in, in Coretz. And then they, they even went to the town where she uh, fled to and hid. And that really, Andy and Mickey can talk, talk about that more, a little bit more specifically, but that really was the gestation period for, um, for, for, the, for the film. They weren't going over there to make a film. They were really going over there to have you know, a personal experience and for, for Andy to, to expose Mickey to you know, um, his, his, mother's, his mother's past. Uh, but out of that trip um, came this idea um, that Andy first you know, pr approached me and said, I, I, my friend's mother's story is really incredible. I think it would make for a great film. And um, he promptly sent the, uh, the testimony that Sarah had given the USC Shoah Foundation. I watched that and was just very uh, entranced by, by the whole thing, about a 90 minute interview. And through that, that interview, I, I then really dug into the story and then uh, Andy then introduced it. Mickey and I, we, we went up to Michigan. I, I met where, where Mickey's from and Andy and I met with, with, uh, with Mickey and talked about it. And about um, a year, about eight to 10 months later, we were over in Ukraine researching uh, the story. Myself, uh, Andy, and uh, the screenwriter, David Himmelstein. And um, it, was, it, it was remarkable. Uh, while I have half of my family comes from there, I had never really been to, to that region specifically of Ukraine, of Vohin, um, in Western Ukraine, close to the, the Polish border. And, um, uh, you know, I, I was immediately struck by, from the, the historical accounts of, of, the, of, the, of, of the town, you know, the, um, pre-war, pre uh, two thirds of the population of the town was Jewish. And it was a, a thriving merchant class there. Um, and when we were there, uh, by the time, you know, obviously, but uh, there's 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 very little uh, history left. Very little history of the Jewish community that was ever there. You would know, have no idea of how robust of a community it was. Uh, and it's um, it's almost like stepping into a time warp and going back in time. Uh, you know, despite the fact that. Uh, it was only a few years ago. It, it felt as though it easily could have been, you know, the the, the '70s, um, and it's very rural and very impoverished, still. Uh, so those were some of my in initial impressions of, uh, of of visiting Koretz and Western Ukraine, where the film takes place. Thank you. I, you mentioned that Andy um, sort of brought everyone together and was there with you and David on the trip. Andy, what were your impressions of Koretz when you went there for the first time? Uh, kind of similar to Steve's, it was uh, looked like an old Soviet uh, outpost. Remember that this uh, area was was Eastern Poland from around 1919 after the first war until the, um, the Russians came in in 39, took that Eastern part of Poland as part of that pact. So it had a big influence. The architecture is mostly like Stalinist era with a little bit going back to pre-era, and as Steve said, it's a it's a impoverished area, so not really much in architecture, landscape, anything new there, and the identity of Jewish life, other than a few headstones that you find in a ran literally a random uh, former cemetery, it's basically devoid of anything. How did how did the townspeople today in Florida react to your showing up as American filmmakers and, and seeking to tell this story? Uh, well, Steve, I mean, maybe you have a different perspective. We only went to Koretz to uh, do some historical, I wouldn't say even research, but just to kind of look at what was uh, on, in the books or in the records that reflected that period of time in the late 1930s and say early 40s. And we hired a, uh, an academic with short notice because Mickey and I's trip over there was kind of a short notice trip to do some research for us and kind of look into the public records and there's very little of that era around there. So we had very little contact with people there and uh, Steve will mention, uh, it made more sense to produce and make the movie in uh, Poland, you know, nowadays current Poland, uh, instead of in Ukraine for logistical reasons. 
So after doing the basic research and getting some historians in there, we the thing shifted to Northeast Poland, which has a very similar uh, geography, topography, everything looks quite the same. And so we didn't have much interaction with the folks other than um, one of the surviving, surviving children of uh, the family that uh, Sarah was with. I won't go into too much detail for folks that haven't seen the movie, but they'll understand that. It has very little contact. Mm. I, so the film begins. Yeah. Well, I'll just I'll just add, Ari. Yeah, that we um, yeah we, we we were not really going over there and advertising the fact that we were making a film. Uh, we kept a pretty low profile, and and you know even at that point we weren't sure necessarily how it was going to unfold. We were still doing uh, a, a lot of research and and kind of you know and concepting the the story. Um, so just wanted to add that. Thank you. Uh, so when I want to get to you guys, Mickey and Zuzana, but I think it would be helpful to introduce Sarah's voice uh, at the beginning of the conversation as well. There's a, uh, some amazing testimony of hers that's available online. Uh, the film begins with Sarah and her brother escaping from Koretz in 1942 by crossing a river and running through a forest to the home of a woman who had been arranged to hide them and then um, declined to do so. So let's watch a, watch a brief clip of the real Sarah Goralnik Shapiro, Mickey's mom, describing that part of the story in 2007 where the film then kicks off. Heard shooting, somebody was shooting and we hid under a bush. And then there was a, I remember, was a, like a, not a pound or what, and you had to cross that in order to run away. And uh, we jumped over there, and uh, I was uh, 10 years old, 11 years old. I didn't know how to swim, and my brother pulled me out by my hair, and we, he was, a man, a boy, and uh, he stronger than I am. He knew how to swim, and he saved me. And we ran over that uh, water, whatever. I, I can't uh, tell you what it was. And we were hiding under the bush, and we went, we ran. It took us more than an hour, two hours, to get to that, to those people. And uh, we came, and it was already 10 o'clock. We knocked in the door, and we said, uh, we came to you, and uh, we didn't say nothing, killing or whatever. And she said, oh my God, oh my God. And she uh, said, we said, we like to stay here for a day or two. And she says, oh, okay, then you can go in the barn and hide and sleep there, and we did. And in the morning she came, and she says, um, I heard that they killed already everybody in chorus. It's everybody's killed. And, uh, and we started to cry, and we knew that that's it. They killed our parents and their two brothers. So at the end of the incident that Sarah is describing in that video clip, the film begins and Sarah spends the next two or three years hiding in plain sight under a, a fake identity. Zuzana, I, I imagine you watched a lot of Sarah's testimony when you were preparing. Can you tell us what it was like to prepare for the role? Of course, I saw some interviews with Sarah and her testimonies. Uh, I was I was really impressed how strong she was and you know brave, um, but just preparing to that role, um, I was having um, acting lessons with amazing actress Paulina. Um, it wasn't like acting lessons how to act. Um, it was something like talking about character, uh, you know, making background of, of the character. Uh, we spoke a lot about Sarah's relationships with her friends, with her family, uh, with her brother. 
uh, obviously. Um, so it was pretty much preparing to and getting to know the story and character uh, and and the relationships she was involved in. It's really stunning that this was your first feature length film um, because you did such an extraordinary job. What was the, what were the hardest scenes for you to film? Um, it depends because physically uh, the most difficult the difficult scene was in the river because the water was freezing. Uh, it was it was really tough. Even Eric, a big guy, was shaking all the time. Uh, but emotionally, uh, the the hardest scene was with with mom because my mom was on a set too. I remember her crying, me thinking about her during that, um, that, that, that scene. So it was, it was really hard, but I think we, we did it great. You did. Now you were born and raised in Poland and you're tuning in from Poland right now for this webinar. Uh, can you tell us what you learned about, about the Holocaust growing up? Um, and do you feel that that prepared you for the role of Sarah in this film? Um, I, was, I was really aware of, of what was happening during that time uh, because everything happened in our area. For example, I live about one hour driving uh, from, from Auschwitz. So it's really, uh, we are aware of, of um, of everything that happened because we learn about it at school. We also are obligated to visit the Auschwitz. Uh, every teenage in Poland has to visit it. Um, so I heard about that stories and all brutal acts, uh, but obviously every story is different and special and, you know, independent. Mickey, what was it like for you after knowing your mom so well to then watch Susanna play her? Well, I was, it was, it was, it was very hard and, and, and it's still hard to watch, but watching her, she was fantastic. She did a great job. And um, I think she, she, she showed us how my mother really, really acted, you know, because you had to be tough and you had to be quiet and you had to be smart. And she was all that. If you watch the, full testimony of Sarah with the Shaw Foundation or with the Holocaust Museum in Washington. I, I, I was struck by the similarities between how well Susanna captured your mom's yes. presence as it was related in the testimony. So you were born in Europe uh, and yes. then you emigrated to the US with your parents as a young child. Can you walk us through, I mean, the film ends with your mom on <clears throat> in the car being rescued by partisans. Can you walk us through what happened to her in the immediate aftermath of the war and how you ended up making your way to the US with her. Okay, my, my mother ends up going back to, um, to, the, to her town. And um, actually she uh, run, runs into my father pretty much um, after she gets there and uh, they get married. After the war people, there was no romance. There was no, there was no, no big weddings. You just got married because and, and, and they wanted to start a family. Nobody had anything left. So everybody got married. Um, and then they, they left Poland. They went to, uh, to Germany uh, to, to go to a DP camp because they stopped immigration out of Poland and Russia. So they had to escape to, to Germany. And from Germany, we ended up going to the United States. So it was 1949 that we got, that we got to the United States. And when you were growing up, was your mom and your dad <laughs> forthcoming about what they had experienced during the Holocaust? Uh, you know, I, I, I heard the stories. They didn't talk much, um, basically, but I was allowed to listen. And I, you know, I spoke y Yiddish and I spoke German. So the survivors would come from Toronto or Chicago or, or, or the ones in Detroit, and they would tell their stories. I, I never asked a question, but I could listen and I heard all the stories and it was pretty pretty frightening. I mean, I've heard everything from people being buried alive uh, to you know, atrocities you wouldn't believe. So, but, I, but I, 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 I heard it and I understood it. That's a lot for a kid to understand. Yes, yes. a lot. We're getting a lot of questions already in the chat about some 
uh, more details of your mom's story. So I wonder if I could ask this to you now. Ellen Berman is asking, did your mom see her friend Manya again after the war? No, no, no. What happened to Manya? Well, she died. We don't know. Yeah, she died back in the, during the war. Okay. And um, Joni Spielberg is asking about what your mom put in her mouth every night when she went to sleep. That was to prevent her from saying. Yes, and that was. And she she suffered from um, from sleep insomnia and from um, fear, and she up until the day she died, she had horrible nightmares, and and, and so she was afraid she'd talk, so she put rags in her mouth. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't understand it. She would talk Yiddish or, or German. After the war, did she ever make contact with the family that she lived with? For no, 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 no. And did you, in, in your and Andy's research in producing the film, did you come across what, what their- Yeah, we, the, 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 the two young boys, I think, I think they went to New York, but we're not sure. I think they did. And the, the, she, they had a daughter too later. And I think she also went to New York. But we're, we're, Are again, we- Andy, we, um, I'll jump in here. Just uh, it's it's Steve. Um, we did we we did track down. Um, so the the two boys uh, both died and were were uh, fought in the Red Army and died in Afghanistan in the early eighties. Uh, after the war, the family had a daughter and they named her Manya. And um, we tracked down Manya. She lived uh, in a, outside or in a, in a, a larger city uh, named Rivne. And we went there and we interviewed her and talked to her. And again, you know, she, we didn't really um, at that point say that announce that we were making a film. We were just, you know, interviewing, getting her, her perspective. Uh, if there were any stories um, about, you know, uh, the war when she was young that she heard. And, and un unfortunately, there wasn't much there. There wasn't much help there uh, to fill it in. Mm. The, the film offers a very nuanced portrayal of the family. I mean, they're, they're, saving Sarah, but they're also abusive and, and anti-Semitic. And I mean, they're complicated characters, which, which is shown well. It, Mickey, how did your mom talk about that family when she told uh, you guys about her experience? Yeah, it, 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 that's a good question, because she really didn't say good or bad. She just said, this is what happened. She never um, never told us they were nice to her. She never told us they were mean to her. Was, this is she just as a fact, this is what happens. Hmm. So there was no emotion. I don't think she was tied to them emotionally. Wow. Well, she, as you notice, she was she she had no emotion throughout the movie, through her whole life. She she kept that to herself, and that's how she survived. I can't imagine what that must have been like to to carry that weight with her throughout her whole mm -hmm. life. So, uh, she passed away in 2018, and it sounds like she. She had opened up early after the war, but told more of her story over time. And, and now here she is on the, on the big screen soon to, for a, a global audience. How, did, did she know that this film was being made about her before she passed away? How'd she feel about it? No, no she didn't know. Mm. We never told her. And uh, at that point, I think she was, she would have been better. She, I don't think she, my mother was very private and I'm sure at, at the early stages, she wouldn't want anybody to know what happened. Um, I think had she seen the, what the film did and the reaction it's getting, I think she'd be very proud of it. Rightfully so. Stephen, I'm sure this was a very challenging film to direct. Uh, when you chose to take on the project, can you talk us through what you felt your responsibilities were to Holocaust history, to Sarah's story? Um, well, it was something I was very aware of and something that uh, I, I know um, just is kind of uh, really intrinsic to who I am as a person, as an artist and anything that I approach, I have a lot of um, thoughtful consideration. And uh, I, I, kinda, I, just, I just knew that that was like, a, there was a good foundation of that, but I really tried not to focus on that. Uh, if, if I did kind of go down any path of, of really kind of stepping outside when we were making it, and, thinking of just how challenging this was and um, the quote unquote pressure to, you know, to, to, to make a film that does Sarah's story and, and Mickey's family's legacy, uh, you know, d does, it, does it right? 
um, I think it, it, it would have been pretty unhealthy for me to, to stay in that frame of mind. So if I, if I was in the you know, moments of that, I would generally kind of you know, think about it to sort of correct myself, um, but tried, really tried not to focus on it and really just tried to stay focused on you know, the, the work and the various stages that we were, we were at in making the film. We, you know, we put in an exhaustive amount of, of research and historical research. And uh, you know, this was not something um, that, that came together uh, overnight. And so I just was very confident that from the start we had you know, a, a, a wonderful team of, of, of a core crew, myself, Mickey and Andy and David. And then we started filling it out. And as Andy, uh, you know, uh, mentioned, we mm. filmed the whole movie in Poland. We started doing the pre-production in Warsaw, did all of our casting in Warsaw and started assembling, you know, this just incredible team of, of uh, top-notch artists in the, in the Polish industry. And um, I, I guess I, I just sort of uh, really tried to, not get lost in the the pressure of of making something that you know that had to live up to quite quite an uh, an incredible story. I imagine that you had you looked at other Holocaust films when you were making this. Did you find inspiration or sort of cautionary tales in other films that uh, <laughs> fed your process? I did um, more so of what I didn't want to do as opposed to what I did want to do. Um, I, I said this often on the set and even before we stepped on the set when Zusana and the other actors and I started rehearsing, uh, I said, you know, sentimentality is our enemy in, you know, in this and I don't want to make a sentimental film. Um, as, as Mickey was describing his mother, you know, to me, one of the, the things I'm most proud of about the film is that I think it's a, a true representation of, of who she was and how she conducted herself in order to survive. And that was uh, without emotion and without sentimentality. And I was confident that we were going to have enough scenes in the film that would move people emotionally. Um, but uh, I just, um, I, I, I really tried to, to stay away from um, too much, you know, I guess, uh, nostalgia that was would sort of infecting you know the creative process if that answers your question yeah and and it's i mean the the film is is based on a true story to a significant degree but i, I believe there were small portions that were fictionalized which, which are those portions and how did you make those decisions sure well um that kind of relates to, to the question i just answered so because sarah was a, a very passive character and was a, a result of of everything happening around her um that's a, a, a difficult those are difficult qualities to hang on the, the hero of your film you know um screenwriting 101 is really you know one of the first things they talk about with with the characters you want to have an active character somebody who goes after things you know so as an audience member you're you're on that journey with them and we knew early on that we couldn't deviate from that because it would have you know not done uh, Sarah's story justice or any truth. So what we did is we, at times we brought in characters um, <clears throat> that Sarah didn't specifically talk about, but we intuited that because we knew that she had to go in, to church every Sunday or she, we, we, knew, we knew that she went to church every Sunday with the family. We knew that she was able to do this for almost two years. We knew that she had to go to communion and, and uh, all the, you know, confession and do these, these other rituals that would have, um, you know, uh, perpetuated the, the, the roots that she was living. Uh, so those characters is what we chose to kind of reflect some of the emotion that Sarah couldn't show herself. For example, uh, there's a, a character in the film of the priest who's, who's um, you know, a, a, a large part of, of Sarah's emotional connection in the film because she couldn't have an emotional connection with anyone else, uh, it would have gotten her killed. So that's an example of someone, uh, we created that character of, a, of the priest, but we know that there, there was a, a, you know, a, a, a priest that Sarah interacted with every Sunday when she went to church, went to confession. Um, one other example that, that, I'll, that I'll mention is that there's a, a story, a true story that Sarah recounted in, in both uh, testimonies and any other interviews that she gave of another young Jewish woman that came to the farm asking to be hid uh, a few months after Sarah was there. And 
know, this is Sarah's first real, real choice of do I help one of my own or, you know, do I, do I help myself? And uh, unfortunately, that young woman was r raped and killed by Pavlo, uh, the, 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 Sarah's employer and his brother. Um, and I made the decision that that was just, it was too much to stomach. Uh, Pavlo was a, you know, an integral character in the film, someone that we were going to have to be with for a long time. And so I, we, we took, we took it from being both of them, the two brothers doing this horrific act together to having it just be the brother. And it's, you know, it, it lessen the sting, if you will, of Pablo's character. And, I, you know, I, I knew I wanted him to be someone that the audience went from loving to hating, you know, these, these sort of complex tones that you speak of. Uh, I, I know it, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that, that that's something that, that you identify with and others identify with. Because I think oftentimes people, when talking about, um, you know, or, or sort of espousing how they would have reacted in those times, they brought, they paint with such a broad stroke and either, either you were good or you were bad. And um, obviously life is much more complex as we all know. Yeah. I, there's a beautiful question from Janice Bernstein for Susanna. Why did you want to play this particular role? Why I wanted to play it? Yeah. Um, I've always wanted to be an actress and I've always, um, you know, sharing myself and and acting dancing singing in front of my parents they had to watch me and you know admire me um and after a couple of research i found that casting and i said mom i really want to go there try it and uh, so we did and that's how everything started and was your english as good at the beginning as it is now uh, definitely not. I mean, I understand everything and I understood everything, but I was so afraid to speak because I was so afraid to make some, um, you know, to say something wrong or, um, or not, you know, in, um, to say something wrong. Yeah. And I was so afraid of that. Um, at the first moment I spoke with Steven, uh, he was giving me some, some directions and always asking me, do you understand what I'm saying? And I was always like, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, and after a couple of, of um, casting, he said to me that, uh, Susanna, you're always saying that you understand, but nothing changed. And then I realized I was so focusing on that. I understand what he's saying to me, not what he want to uh, say to me. I understand everything what he was saying, but I haven't, you know, think about it. And after that moment, I realized that it doesn't matter um, if I'm saying it right or wrong. Uh, and the most important thing is to communicate. And I think my English was good enough to communicate. And, and you were 15 when you started acting in the film, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Um, I want to ask about the sets in the film. They're, they're I mean, the, the photography is beautiful and the sets are striking. There's, I'm particularly thinking of some of the scenes in the town square where there's big Nazi flags with swastikas and there are um, Nazi and partisan uniforms. Uh, I guess, Stephen, what was it like to create these fake Nazi items for the set and then spend all this time around them emotionally? Um, and what are some of the moral questions you deal with when doing that? And I'm also wondering, do you just throw them out when you're done or is there some, can you reuse, do people in, in Hollywood trade set pieces like that and you can reuse them? Um, well, uh, most of them are actually in my garage in boxes that were shipped over from uh, from Poland. And um, you know, when the film does have its theatrical release later, we fully intend to have you know an exhibit of, of some of uh, the, the costumes because there's just incredible artistry that went into them and so much authenticity. A lot of the the, the costumes are actually authentic. Period. A lot of the military stuff was, um, and we purchased it, so it wasn't going to be thrown out. Um, but your first question, uh, again, you know, I, 
you, you don't have much time to kind of get lost in, in, in thoughts of like, how is this going or how, you know, how does this square against the real world? And the filmmaking, you know, it's such an insular myopic like process that you're very just kind of like focused on everyone, hopefully, and collectively focused on the task at hand. So I didn't have really that many moments. And I, I purposely tried not to have many moments where I stop out, step outside myself and, you know, psych myself out. Because if I did, I think I, I would have gotten, you know, rather, rather nervous of all of the pressure that you, you know, you alluded to earlier in that, that question. And then also just the fact that, you know, we were filming this in northeastern Poland. Um, the, the region is, is called Podlasia, near the, the city of Białystok. And it has a, you know, a, an atrocious history with the Jewish, Jewish people. It was one of the, you know, first areas where the Einsatzgruppen had, had gone through and just decimated most of the Jewish population early on before most of the camps. Uh, and again, these were you know, thriving Jewish communities in, in many of these towns, you know, overwhelming the majority of the population were Jews, uh, hubs of culture and, and merchants. And so uh, you go there now and there's none of that. Uh, you know, in Bialystok, they, you have to really, really search for a tiny little plaque that they have that commemorates the, you know, the shul that was burned to the ground there with Jews you know, chained inside. And um, I, I, would, I would actually take most of that stuff in when I would run on the weekends. I would do, go for long runs, and that's where I would kind of, you know, be Steve, an American Jew running through an area that, clear, you know, 70 years ago was the site of some awful, awful uh, scenes. But when we were making the film, you know, I guess, again, just like very, very focused on what we were doing. One quick little anecdote that I'll share, the, the town square that you mentioned, uh, that was filmed in a, a, a small village named Tekochin, which is um, just outside of Bialystok, and again, had a very thriving Jewish population. That building that has the, the um, swastika banners on it was actually the, the shul, and now is a, a museum. Um, and when we first uh, came there to kind of concept how this was all gonna, the sets were gonna be you know, built there, uh, our incredible production designer, a very talented man named Marek Zavarucha, who built everything, he and his team built everything. Um, we, you know, I came up with, I said, well, let's, let's because this, this building was so stark and white, you know, and, and we obviously wanted to show the presence of, of uh, Nazi Germany, we came up with this idea to put these two banners. And a few weeks later, we were there the day before filming doing a, a, a scout just to make sure it was all right. Everything was set for the following day when we were to be there to film. And I stepped out of the van and I remember I looked up and I saw these, these two banners and, you know, I almost, I kind of second guessed myself and I pulled Mark aside and I was like, you know, is this, uh, this is desecrating, you know, like just because I said, let's put up these two banners and they're there. Like, I, I shouldn't have this much autonomy. And, um, and he said, yeah, no, 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 don't second guess yourself. This is why we're doing this. This is, you know, this ne needs to be portrayed. Um, so that's just a, a little insight of kind of how I would go between uh, my personal feelings and, and you know, my, my professional feelings, which is when we were really in the you know, throes of, of making the film. Thank you. It's, it's different than making films, but as a Holocaust museum, we have a collection of almost 40,000 objects. And a lot of those are Nazi flags and other sort of unseemly items. And so we have a lot of conversations about what the right thing to do is when you are uh, the keepers of items that have so much symbolic power. Mickey, d did your mom bring anything physical with her to the States, documents, artifacts, items from her life in Koritz before the war? Yes, yeah. now she brought, uh, she had some gold dishes, Rosenthal Pompadour, they were very, she wanted those and she brought those. Um, she and, and she brought some pillows and the, the down feathers and just stuff that we were supposed to go to Israel from 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 Poland uh, from 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 Germany. We we're going to go to Israel. The last minute, uh, an uncle found our family and uh, and sent us uh, packages, literally uh, um, uh, Hershey's and 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 and, uh, and nylons, and wrote us letters and said. I'm a very wealthy man, come to the United States and um, the streets are paved with gold. So at the last moment, we, we had everything's ready for Israel. We sent everything to Israel. We actually had a little trucking company 
and we sent the trucks and jeeps and ambulances. We sent it to to Israel, and uh, and uh, then we uh, went to the United States, and uh, we never got. Back. My dad had a sister, and he told her to sell it and keep half. Unfortunately, we never got it, and the uncle died after about uh, a month here. I just want to mention Anita Feinstein in the audience wrote in and said, FYI, Sarah babysat me in Corez. I don't know if you know Anita, but that's amazing. Uh, Mickey, did you and your, your mom ever travel to Israel after, you know? Yes, later? yeah, the whole family, yeah, we did, yes. What was that like? Um, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful, it was a great experience. Well, we've, I've been there many times and so it's, it's in her too. And did she visit Poland or Ukraine after the war? No, no, she wouldn't. She wouldn't go to Poland. She wouldn't go to Ukraine. My father either. They wouldn't go back. They wouldn't. They wouldn't any part of it. What was her Jewish identity like later in life? Do you think that her experience, uh, you know, living the identity of of someone who was Christian, did that affect her religiously? No, she 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 went to synagogue. Um, and she she went and then she hired a teacher to teach her how to read Hebrew, hmm. and she she loved it. She really did. There are a couple of audience questions about the uh, process of historical research, how you guys so accurately portrayed the setting. I want Andy, maybe perhaps you could walk us through that process in a little bit more detail and how you constructed the, the life of these farmers beyond uh, just Sarah's testimony. I mean, it was, it was important for us and I in particular when we started the idea with Steve I wanted it to be as authentic as possible down to the finest detail. Kind of like when uh, in the Godfather, uh, Coppola made sure that they had printed invitations and, and matches on the tables. Of course, nobody would ever see it, but to kind of give this authenticity. So we dug very much into local uh, historians and understanding the way they would dress, the way they would look, including you mentioned the, the German uniforms had to be authentic for uh, Nazi and, and SS personnel that would be in that region during that time went to that level of detail. So we were, you know, really concerned that it would be like that. And we, Mickey and I, we went to the town where Mickey's mom uh, was, was hiding and we just kind of stumbled on a bunch of stuff, including the church where she had told us that she had gone when she was in hiding there or when she was living there. And so we had a certain colors or, you know, Russian Orthodox church. And in Poland, the only part of Poland that really is populated with Russian Orthodox is this Białystok up in the Northeast. So the church looks very similar, both internally and externally to the one that we saw where she really was. Again, it was very important for us. And what about that scene where I think it was called Malanka. It was the Ukrainian or Russian New Year. Can you explain what was going on there? Well, what we understood was that they have even to this day in Russia, and more so even in Ukraine, this idea of the old New Year, which is based on the old you know, the Julian calendar. So it, uh, it, it's the 12th to the 13th instead of the 31st to the 1st, which is how you know we all celebrate New Year's now. It's still celebrated and that is very particular to that region and um, that kind of those characters that they portray or, or folklore that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years so that's a something that even today is celebrated some say hardcore uh, ukrainian orthodox ukrainians that are still in that area and even further further west in ukraine and is there actually a tradition of having a, a jew in the yes celebration yeah, I mean, again, as a as a as a, a cartoon character, as much as anything else, I don't think it was uh, anti-Semitic per se, but it was just uh, you know a way to portray people that they thought were like uh, you know cartoonish. Of course, you see the the Jew is a, is a characterization of a of um, of a you know an older Jew who's punched over, holding money and all that, which was like the perception of Jewish money lenders so i guess you know it's anti-semitic in the sense that it, these are cartoon characters but it wasn't based on religious stuff it was based on you know the characters of the time going back again to the 16th century 
Susanna, what did you learn um, from the process of, of bringing Sarah to, the, to life in the movie? And did it change your sense of what it means to be Polish? Technically, I learned a lot and I'm really grateful that I had a chance to um, work with amazing actors and learn from them. Uh, but like I said before, uh, I was aware of, uh, of, of stories like that. So I hasn't learned much like in historical facts uh, because I knew about it. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the rest of the question? I forgot. <laughs> about, um, about your Polish identity, but I think you spoke, um, spoke beautifully about the history being a part of, a part of the identity, it's something you've carried yeah, with you. So I, I think nothing changed because I knew about, about it. And obviously for me, um, there's, the, we cannot, you know, separate people from then and others uh, because there was no black or white, good or bad. Everybody, uh, it, it doesn't matter what nationality, religion or, or whatever they were, uh, every decision they made, they made by themselves and they, they choose by, by themselves what they want to do. And, you know, I think when I, when I think about living during war, uh, I'm pretty sure that everybody just wanted to survive and every decision was made um, to, to, to keep their families safe and everybody thought they were doing the best to keep safe and to survive. And what are your next steps, Susanna? I, are you in school in Poland or you'll continue uh, acting? Uh, I'm in school, I'm in high school. Uh, I'm in last year of high school right now. Uh, so now I'm actually right now, I'm preparing to uh, final exams. And after that, I'm going to apply to college. Well, thanks for making the time in the midst of your final exams to be speaking with us. <laughs> of course. Uh, Steven, can you tell us about the plans for theatrical release and the film festival circuit you guys have been doing? Sure. So um, as you mentioned at the start, the film was to be released in June of 2020 in uh, theaters in, in North America. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, uh, but I know that uh, Andy and Mickey and I and our, our distribution partner, Strand Releasing, we're all committed to releasing the film theatrically. And we think that, you know, the film is clearly, it's, it's a timeless story. It's no less relevant, um, you know, 10 months, 12 months, 15 months from now than it will be right now. And um, I think we're actually really, really excited about some of the opportunities that we have because while the film uh, certainly deals with some heavy, heavy material and um, some difficult subject matter, it, it's, a, it's a movie of hope and it, you leave the film watching, uh, my hope, excuse me, uh, for, for watching the film is that you have that sense of, of hope and optimism and perseverance um, by, by watching this because it's extraordinary that a child, you know, a young child who was 11 years old when this started overnight had to become an adult um, and, and you know, navigated this extremely perilous path and was able to sur survive. So I, we feel as though when theaters do open up, uh, most likely not until the end of this year or even early next year, that it, it's going to be uh, a really a, a wonderful contribution. Um, and, it, and clearly, you know, there's something even pre-pandemic that we all discussed, you know, the, the scene in the film where Sarah has to say goodbye to her parents, you know, and her mother tells her, you have to survive because your survival is our revenge. And that's a direct quote, what, what Sarah said that her mother told her. And that's something that clearly, you know, still lives on through the, the making of this film. Everybody here that's participating in the discussion, uh, that's, um, you know, that, that's carrying on that legacy is, is uh, honoring the revenge of all of, you know, Sarah's family and all the other millions who, who perished. I, hearing that quote and then seeing the photo at the very end in the credits, Mickey, of your, of your mom with your family was, was really beautiful. It made it come to life. Uh, 
We have some questions about whether your mom spoke to school groups when she was alive and whether you speak to school groups or, or other groups now about your family story. Uh, I'm doing it now because of the film. Mm -hmm. And actually, we're going, it's not really just school groups. It's, it's in everybody. We just see different groups of people. But it's, we're getting a lot more uh, interaction. So far since you've been doing the festival circuit and these limited screens. I'm sorry, I'm sorry you just cut out. When you've been promoting the film thus far and speaking to groups, how have people reacted? Very, very good and wonderful. More than I expected. It's, 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 it's great seeing the reaction of the people. People love this movie. And, and we've gotten a lot of, uh, thank you everyone who's writing in the chat about your own perspectives on the film. It's uh, wonderful. Um, Mickey, what do you hope the world will take away from learning your mom's story in this way? Lots of things. The, first of all, the, the world has to see, I'm sorry, the world has to see what happened and, and see how, 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 how man treated each other, how terrible it was. And then to see a young girl survive and really a 11 year old girl all by herself. And she's the only one that survived her family. And, and to see how she did it, what happened, and, 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 and to learn from it. It's, it's, it's a very important story, especially today. It, it's, it's especially important today because of survivors who are aging and passing away, because of anti-Semitism rising around the world. And I wanna ask about something, it's a sensitive subject, but it, it's also important today, uh, I think, because there is uh, increasing tension around Holocaust narratives in Eastern Europe and uh, who is blamed and uh, uh, nuanced portrayals of, of guilt and innocence. I'm wondering if, if uh, that when you guys were making the film, how you considered um, that contemporary issue uh, and whether you've gotten any negative reactions from people who feel that you, you focus too much on uh, the role of Polish or Ukrainian bystanders. I'll jump in on that. I'll say that one. I mean, you know, of course, uh, um, you know, film film is art, and art is subjective, and not everybody is going to love everything that you do. And so, you know, yes, we, we've heard some some detractors, and um, I think though, what was really important to us that Andy was talking about earlier is that you know we we knew what we were doing, and we knew the importance and the gravitas of you know approaching this film and putting it out into the world and therefore that's why we spent so much time going to great lengths to make sure that the history is correct like andy talks about you know down to the armbands were, were the the you know the, the right armbands for that region at that time the uniforms um and we consulted heavily with the usc shoah foundation early on and obviously you know they're they're at the forefront of of, of this fight and we knew also the importance of, of getting it right, because if there were a number of, of um, falsities, if you will, you know, in the film, it would give people credence to be able to poke holes in it. And while, you know, by no means uh, would I say somebody is wrong if they don't respond to it because of its, you know, the story or emotionally they didn't, they didn't react to it or however it was filmed. Uh, but in terms of the accuracy, the historical accuracy, that, that cannot be um, fudged. And, um, uh, you know, but, but it's obviously there, there's these, these are very, very, very complex issues. Uh, they go way back, you know, hundreds of years, uh, and as Andy mentioned, to, you know, and, and they're still ripe today. Um, so it's, uh, there, there's, there's a lot there. The film uh, has not been released yet in Eastern Europe. Uh, in, in Ukraine or Poland or even Russia, they're waiting for the U.S. release to happen first, and then um, Eastern Europe will likely follow soon after that. I assume it'll still be in English mostly, but there will be subtitles in uh, languages. Yeah, usually the, the individual market that the film plays in will do a local um, language subtitle. So for people who love the film and want to uh, share it with their friends and family. It's obviously not publicly available right now. Can you tell us how, how folks can stay posted on uh, updates with the film? Sure, the, the easiest way would be through our, our website, mynameissarah.com or the Facebook page. 
Um, and there are going to be a number of events such as this uh, going forward uh, over the course of the next few months, in a, you know, along with a number of virtual film festivals uh, that we'll be doing until the film is able to be presented in a, in a physical uh, environment. And you know, we're already talking to people about when that would be and locations of, of where that would be. So you know, I, I understand that um, it, it's, uh, it's hard to kind of be patient and everybody has become so accustomed to consuming you know, content on demand when they want it now. And we've all been sitting at home now for 10 months you know, wanting to, 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 to um, basically consume the next piece. Uh, just please just, you know, be patient with us and, um, and just know that, you know, the film will be, will be in theaters and, uh, we're committed to that. And, and so, uh, just, you know, keep that, keep checking back. If you want to know about any of the uh, online events that we're doing, they should be every few weeks opportunities to see the film, uh, and then participate in, uh, in discussions like this as well. Thank you. Let's, let's end with this last question, which is beautiful from David. Um, Mickey, uh, can you tell us about Sarah's kids and grandkids and her legacy today? How, what, uh, how big is your family? Where does everyone live? What's everyone up to? Well, everybody, everybody lives in Michigan and actually not within 10 minutes of, of each other. Um, she's got uh, uh, four grandkids, uh, two, great, uh, two great kids just, grandkids just got born. And one his name is Sarah oh. and one is Aiden. So, uh, yeah, and, and the family's like about a dozen people, which is a lot better than two or three. And, and it's a close family, very close family. The best revenge. Thank you. Uh, we're hitting the hour here, so um, we'll conclude the panel. But uh, on behalf of the museum, big thanks to each of you, Mickey, Andy, Stephen, and Zuzana, for your time and for sharing the film with us. Uh, and thank you to all of you in the audience for joining us. Uh, we are so glad to present this along with the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial Foundation run by Dr. Maria Zalewska, a great partner of the museum. Uh, and we appreciate all the work of the USC Shoah Foundation in helping to produce the film and, and um, bring it to audiences. Uh, I should mention that all of our work at the museum is made possible by community members like you. So thank you to those of you who support the museum. If you don't, we hope you'll consider becoming members and joining our other programming. You can check it out at the link in the chat.